Okay, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is two minutes and 13 seconds or so after two o'clock, and we are set to go. Uh, I notice we've got 28 participants so far, so that kind of rules out just chatting back and forth. So here's what we need to do. If you have a comment or a question, please use the Q&A box and type in your Q&A. Uh, we've got about 50 slides to go through here, so that's uh, like one every two minutes and such and such. So, um, and if you have any administrative issues, type those into the chat box and then our host will be happy to deal with those and give you those answers. So any questions or comments on the program, please use the Q&A for that. Okay. So uh, today we're here to talk about climate change facts and solutions. And uh, after all, that's what we're all about, aren't we? As engineers and architects, uh, we like to solve problems. We got a dandy out there right now, but fortunately we got a lot of cost-effective and very sensible solutions at hand. And we are in fact grabbing onto them very quickly. Uh, and it's encouraging from my outlook. I've been watching this for 20 years and we are very close to turning a corner if we all get busy and, and, and stay uh, diligent. Uh, participants moved up to 30. Okay, so let's, let's move on. And uh, not, uh, by the way, as you know, the <clears throat> slides are available. Uh, so that if you find something of interest or if I went through something too quickly in order to make sure we get done by four o'clock, uh, just order up a set of the slides. And uh, that way you can uh, show them to everybody on your phone at dinner tonight or something like that. So we're going to talk about what's happening, how serious, a little bit of fiction versus fact, but not much, not too many people think there's well, there is some fiction still going on, but what can we do about it? What it will it cost? And uh, these are the areas we're going to talk about. Okay, so here we go. Here's some of the fiction. I'm just going to type it out quickly because you may have heard it. That It's a hoax. I, I, not too many people feel that way anymore. Some feel it's not caused by humans and that it's temporary. Well, yeah, if, you, if 200 years is temporary, that's a long time for me, but... Uh, and uh, uh, one of the favorites is that, oh, well, they had 11 years or, 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 of drought back in 1860 or something. And so they, this is nothing. And anyway, um, and and some of the, uh, the homeschooler materials prove that the average temperature hasn't changed by drawing an average for a curve that continues to rise and showing that even a, a rising curve has an average value. So anyway, and, and uh, I live on the ocean and I can see that there's a whole lot more to worry about than sea level rise. Although the parking lot of the hotel up the street did kind of flood over one day last week during King Tide. And that's the first time I've seen that. So uh, interesting. Anyway, first we need to make the distinction between climate and weather. And I think pretty clearly what you see here is weather. Uh, but climate is a little different. And if we look it up in the dictionary, then uh, weather is simply what's out there right now. Like I got mostly cloudy and it just quit raining. But climate on the other hand is the average course of conditions uh, over a period of time. And generally over a period of many years and uh, it takes a look at what some of the absolute strict streams are and so forth. And, and I don't think anybody on this group has any question about the difference between weather and climate. So let's just take a quick look at greenhouse gas effect because people talk about the greenhouse effect a lot. Um, and it, the whole idea that if you shine the sunshine through the glass window of your car, it gets hot in there. A classic example of the greenhouse effect or the greenhouse for that matter, where you can grow plants in the winter time. But uh, <clears throat> what it's about is visible and, infra and invisible infra uh, infrared radiation. 
Uh, and uh, these are just some of the things that, that I think are pretty well known that uh, if we don't give off as much heat at night as we take on during the day, then obviously we're going to heat up. That, that's pretty straightforward uh, basic physics and thermodynamics. Um, and, and so if something tries to prevent that nighttime uh, heat, from the planet from being reflected back out into space uh, beyond the atmosphere, then the next day when the sun comes up, if it just keeps doing that day after day after day after day, and if you can't get rid of the amount of heat that you take on, then there's nothing else can happen other than it, it heats up. All right, so, um, the only way we can restore the equilibrium is to raise this temperature of the Earth. Of course, I mean, one there, there, there are a lot of things in here trying to keep the problem from becoming really terrible from a natural standpoint. Simply the fact that radiation is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. And so one degree change makes quite a difference. I just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, so let's take a look quickly at the radiation specter from the sun and the earth. Now, clearly the, the sun up there at 5,800 Kelvin, that's uh, what you get with a 5,800 Kelvin black body. The spectrum looks like the blue line. And the fact that it has that huge peak at 10 to the 14th, and notice the units over there are kind of unusual. These are watts per square meter per meter of wavelength. And a, a meter of wavelength is uh, a whole lot when we're looking at wavelengths in the, in, in the order of 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 meters here in the uh, horizontal scale. But in any case, uh, here's the Earth at 300, and you notice it's way up. Well, where is it? Here's the visible right here. And gosh, what an interesting surprise that our human eyes and most other animals' eyes just happen to be the most responsive at the peak of sunlight uh, in the range somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 4,000 to 8,000, give or take a few uh, uh, nanometers. Uh, I'm sorry, 400 to 800. Uh, over here, we've got the ultraviolet. Thank goodness it's, it's dropping off there. Uh, otherwise, we'd have some serious problems with uh, skin cancer and whatever else. And here we've got the infrared over here. And, and clearly, the radiation from the Earth, you can't see it. It's, it's in the infrared. So it's only something that can be felt. So just when somebody asks you, what does the spectra look like? Well, here's your picture. Feel free to show it to all your friends. Uh, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> 93 million mile trip from the sun to the top of our atmosphere, the sun's intensity drops off to 1,367 watts per square meter. And that's useful because uh, if we can use some of those watts for rather than just heating the planet, making electricity and helping uh, uh, either from the wind blowing or water falling or whatever, uh, we can take advantage of those 1367, but not all of them, because by the time it gets to the surface of the Earth, we've lost about a third of it, and we're down to about a thousand watts per square meter. All right, and that's over the entire spectrum. That's what we have at the surface of the Earth, and we can either make good or make bad of it. And uh, if we do the right thing with it, we can take a big chunk out of the problem that we're having with global warming. Um, I find it interesting in this picture, there's quite a few solar systems on roofs here, uh, but, and unfortunately they're on a roof, otherwise they would have gotten pretty, pretty uh, soaked. But uh, what's happening with the CO2, as measured for many, many years at the observatory at Mauna Loa, Hawaii, is it's increasing. And the question is, where is it going to go from here? Is it going to take the historic pattern, number one? If it does that, uh, my great-grandson, when he turns 80, 
in the uh, year 2100, he will be in a pretty hot spot if he makes it that far, if the planet makes it that far. The significance of two and three are that it is generally agreed upon by those who pay a lot of attention to these things that somewhere between 200, 425 and 440 parts per million. Uh, the whole business of global climate change goes into a runaway condition. Just like if you don't have the control rods properly immersed uh, in, in a nuclear reactor, uh, if you pull them out too far, then it, it goes out of control and can actually melt down. So uh, we're, we're, we're looking at once the CO2 gets up to somewhere between 425 and 440, then it's just going to keep on going up all by itself, and there's not much we can do about it. So what we really need to be thinking about then, given that it takes a long time, if you notice number four, that's about how, how slowly the CO2 will drop down if we quit emitting all CO2 tomorrow. So we've got a job ahead, and the question is, what can we do? I'm going to just quickly run through these 11 tipping points and get to the solutions. But these are the next, next 11 tipping points that uh, I, I want you to see is just to show that sea level rise is only a small, a small part of it. Uh, because one another one is simply, uh, well, uh, number one, for example, uh, and water vapor, my goodness, uh, who would have thought water vapor? But water vapor actually is a greenhouse gas because, well, fortunately, it prevents sunlight from getting through to a large extent during the daytime. So, but the problem is at night, it uh, also traps heat and it's harder for it to uh, escape. Uh, those of you any living up north uh, probably recognize that because uh, in the wintertime, when it gets really cold at night, it generally gets colder when it's nice and clear uh, because it's easier for the heat to escape. When there's clouds, that's a blanket that keeps it in. So uh, here's some numbers, okay? And um, if these are the thing that you find useful, then uh, take a look at these later. Uh, issue being that after a point, if we are not careful with water vapor, and water vapor and clouds are different because water vapor condenses to become clouds, which then uh, ultimately, as it gets cool enough, it, it'll rain. Number two is the total amount of melting ice. And ice on land melting increases sea levels, okay? And if a big ice shelf breaks off, that can rapidly increase the sea level. And this fresh water that tends to stay on the top of the salt water uh, can also cause problems. Number three is the albedo effect, which simply says if you've got ice in the ocean, it can reflect the uh, uh, sun's light back. But if the ice melts, then it's simply all absorbed by the ocean. And so if it's all absorbed, then the water's going to get warmer, it's going to melt more ice, it's going to absorb more heat. And I think you get the picture. And that we, we all are aware that that's happening up uh, in, in the, uh, what's that called, the Northwest Passageway, uh, just north of uh, uh, Canada. So, and then there's a melting permafrost issue. And here's a few things about melt that melt. melt melting permafrost. The thing is, there's a lot of methane trapped in permafrost. So if it melts, it releases the methane, which then is between 20 and 100 times more potent than uh, carbon dioxide um, for about 10 years or so, because methane actually does break down in the atmosphere to become water and carbon dioxide. But well, okay, methane equals carbon dioxide, and that's why we go 20 to 100 times, because of it's kind of a matter of how long you estimate that it's going to stay there before it totally decomposes and into carbon dioxide and water, both of which are also greenhouse gases. So uh, another one of those issues that uh, that's a fairly serious threat, uh, not only the melting permafrost. 
Now, what is this? This is not the, the uh, COVID virus. This happens to be plankton. And as the ocean becomes more acidic from this carbonic acid, from the CO2, that normally the ocean removes a lot of the CO2, but if it had an overload to remove, its pH goes down. And that does not keep the plankton happy. And the plankton just happened to be responsible for a goodly amount of the oxygen that's released from plants. Because after all, the plankton, our plants, they eat the carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. And so we don't want to mess with these plankton, not just because it disrupts the food chain and for the fish, but because it produces 50 to 80, 50 to 80 percent of the world's oxygen supply. And notice in the lower right corner here, you've got references on all these. Um, so number six, ocean surface water transferring to the bottom and the top. In other words, it's like you got a pot of water ready to boil on the stove and you stir it to make sure the water is uniformly warm throughout. And that's kind of what happens in the ocean uh, simply because of differences in density and tides and flow and, and currents and so forth. Um, and then there's uh, the loss of forest. And uh, certainly the Canadians and the California folks are well aware of loss of forest that's been happening lately at a level significantly higher than has ever happened in any recent past. Um, number eight, release of carbon from soils, drying out. Not happening here in Florida at the moment, but it certainly is happening in other places. And that's, so that's another thing that a lot of people don't think about. And the whole idea here is to show you some other things that when people say, well, such and such hasn't happened, well, there's uh, 10 other such and suches that are indeed happening, uh, even if they don't believe in that uh, uh, the, the one particular one. So changes in major ocean currents. And again, this is another related thing about the uh, cold water at the bottom of the ocean being disturbed such that it comes up to the top and, and warms. Um, so actually, uh, my understanding, we've got folks down here in Florida who uh, measure the speed of the Gulf Stream, and it, it is apparently measurably getting slower. And so those who wanted to harness the energy of the Gulf Stream, they'd better hurry up because it's, it's slowing down such that, and, and furthermore, the energy available is proportional to the cube of the speed of the Gulf Stream. So uh, just like the energy available from wind. So... Uh, and weather patterns again. I don't know if you all have noticed the hurricanes tend to be going up the middle of the Atlantic and hitting places like Newfoundland. Uh, it's been unheard of. Uh, bad storms, but not as bad as what they got last year. And some of the nasty stuff going through the New York and New England, it's even this year. Um, and of course, uh, so, so again, just. Uh, uh, I wanted to show you these 11 points, and we understand what global pandemic is now as far as uh, uh, COVID, uh, but what else is buried in this and frozen in this permafrost? Uh, who knows? And, and but, but we'll probably find out some stuff, whether there's anything there, but there's certainly a potential situation. And... If the wrong thing is in there, it could be a real threat. And number 11, the total weight of the rising seas and the melting ice shifting. And uh, when that extra weight presses down, it's amazing what can happen. Because you think of the coefficients of expansion of, of various materials and they're relatively small, but then think about how many inches or how many miles a tectonic plate might, might, might expand if it increases its temperature by one degree more than it normally does, and it's a thousand miles long. Um, that can cause some very interesting, interesting pressures and in, that result in earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, who, who knows what. Um, so, there's stuff out there. 
and folks have been watching Yellowstone for a long time, and and that it's very kind of pretty frightening about things like Yellowstone and some of the places and other uh, regions of the planet, like Iceland, where there's a lot of activity underground that's trying to get out. So <clears throat> anyway, that's a quick rundown on some stuff that maybe not everybody is familiar with all of it. And I just want to make sure that that's as background material. So now let's look where we are. Uh, it, it's interesting to compare 2018 versus 2021 in terms of the United States utility electric generation. And by the way, we're going to be focusing a lot on the United States, but I have to tell you that in a lot of areas, the United States is behind other parts of the world in terms of, of uh, overcoming some of these issues. And we'll mention those as it seems appropriate. But here's the 2018 picture. Um, natural gas, 35.6% of the electricity, coal, 27.8%. You can read those numbers. So the predominance of electrical generation is from fossils, renewables, and nuclear. That's 2018. Here, we're looking at 2021. Let's see what we got for a mix in 2021. <clears throat> well, natural gas is now up to 38.3% from 35.6. Coal is down from 899, for 80, sorry, from uh, 1146 to 899. That's pretty significant. <clears throat> Nuclear is up from 807. No, it's not. It's down from 807 down to 778. <clears throat> the reason for that is because it's getting very expensive to... Uh, uh, you notice nobody's building new nuclear plants because they're, uh, you know, we'll do some economics here in a little while, but uh, it's, it's very expensive now to meet all the constraints that have been imposed for building a nuclear plant. So regardless of whether they uh, are not carbon emitters, uh, they're expensive. Uh, notice the total renewables are up to eight. 26 billion kilowatt hours from 703. Now that's a pretty significant increase, isn't it? It's not almost 15% increase in, in renewables in uh, three years. And uh, now total renewables, <clears throat> excuse me, that does include hydroelectric. And uh, anyway, that little green slot there, that, that's uh, something that wasn't even on the charts back in 2018, and that's the non-utility photovoltaics. And uh, it's because people like you and me are installing that on our roofs like there's no tomorrow. Matter of fact, I reviewed a set of plans this morning for residential installation of 50 kilowatts of photovoltaic power with a whole lot with, with, with another 30 kilowatt hours of, of backup <clears throat> for, for storage. So people are really moving on installing their own solar. Uh, and, and that's in Florida, but all over the place, all over the world, uh, photovoltaics is growing really quickly, as is wind and all of the other renewables. They're growing because they're becoming cost effective. And uh, need more, look at this, look at the U.S. Energy Information Administration. That's where this comes from. All right, there's two questions. Let's take a quick look here. We'll see what we got. Uh, mount of land burn annually. Oh, it's possible the amount of land burned annually has fallen because once you start burning it all, there's not much left to burn. Uh, it, it, it's very possible that the amount burned annually is, is dropping. Um, but uh, I, I guess really what we need to talk about is, uh, well, that's, that's a good point. And, and maybe at some point, maybe all the trees will just burn down and we won't have to worry about it anymore. I don't know. Let's see, is there a tight correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature? Has a model been developed? What's the R squared? Um, folks do have these correlations and uh, 
the 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 same people who talk about, about who who draw these pictures uh, like the Mauna Loa curves, and uh, I I don't know the R square value, but that's the reason I guess you probably could figure it because they figure it's somewhere between 425 and 440 is is uh, the tipping point where we we there's a point of no return. So I suppose uh, if R squared is going to measure a 63% point, um, that's going to be some kind of, and, and clearly in order to project into the future, uh, folks have developed models. The question is uh, the, the model of, of going as uh, oftentimes the future can predict it, be predicted on the basis of what's been happening in the past. And the question is, if it is clearly, uh, if we keep on going the way we're going, uh, we're going to pass that four or four hundred forty mark, and uh, unless we do something about it, and there are lots of other things that we'll be talking about here. That if we don't do it, is it good or bad? So I'm going to uh, uh, just click these as being over, and uh, hopefully by the end we will have shed some light on some of these concerns. Um, here's the amount of CO2 production by the electrical generation sector. 2018, big time, coal, 65% of it, natural gas, 33%. So even though natural gas was making more electricity than coal, it's a lot cleaner. And the other things, uh, 2%. Uh, moving on to word my uh, 2021 coal at 59 percent instead of 65 natural gas up at 40 percent rather than 33 percent because we're using more but what's important is how the comparison 1.77 gigatons in 2018 total versus 1.71 in 2021, even though we made more electricity in 2021 than we did in 2018. So that's encouraging. Utilities are onto it and they're working to uh, reduce, certainly to, to coal is the, the biggest offender at about 2.2 pounds per uh, kilowatt hour of CO2 and natural gas is down around 0.9 pounds per kilowatt hour of CO2. So that's a good reason for pursuing it, at least as an intermediate step. Um, what about U.S. energy consumption by sector? Because after all, if we're going to solve a problem, we need to identify it pretty carefully. The electricity sector, 37%, 28% transportation industry, 22 Now, keep in mind, this is primary energy consumption. And everybody uses electricity. So the 37% is the amount of primary energy that's used in order to supply everybody with their electricity. Transportation, 28%. Now you've seen what's used for the electricity. It, it's uh, primarily natural gas, coal, and renewables, and, uh, and, and nuclear. And uh, transportation, we pretty much know what that is. That's, that's petroleum. Uh, industry, 22%. There's a fair amount of coal, natural gas. Industry heats up and melts a lot of stuff. So uh, they don't just do that with electricity or heat pumps. They do that with coal and, and primary fuels. And as do a lot of residents who still that still have uh, natural gas and other petroleum products for heating and cooking and water heating and so forth. So... This is what's happening. And with that energy consumption, this is the CO2 production. Once again, electricity, 28% of the total. Transportation, 29%. Industry, 22%. So if we can kind of clean up those three, uh, that, that's big progress towards uh, all of them. Of course, the target we need to, to, to shoot for is to reduce the production rate to the rate at which it gets converted back into oxygen by our friends, the plants that do photosynthesis. And we're about 10 to one at, at this point, about 10 times more production of CO2 than, than uh, uh, the plants uh, using it up. 
So uh, here's the picture. And clearly, uh, engineers have a little influence in electricity industry and transportation. And there's even agricultural engineers who can have some industry. So, and, and my goodness, uh, if it's not architects and engineers who design re residential and commercial buildings uh, and, and all things that can be done with them. So we're looking at what some of the opportunities might be. Transportation, personal vehicles, 80% or 58% of the CO2 production, large trucks, 23%. All right. Um, so that's the United States stuff. Here's another Q&A up here. Let's take a quick look. Uh, electric cars, buses, trains fall under the transportation sector or the electric sector. They are under the transportation sector. They buy their electricity from the electric sector. And so the electric sector, CO2 production, uh, part of their CO2 production then goes into cars, buses, and trains. So we can't say if the next question, Krista, is, uh, well, then how can we say that electric cars are clean? Uh, the answer is we can't. We can say they're a lot cleaner. Um, I happen, we happen to own a, a plug-in hybrid that we drive mostly on electricity. We're getting around 1,500 to 2,000 miles per gallon. And the electricity we burn versus if we're burn, burning gas, gas is round numbers, 20 pounds of CO2 per gallon. Electricity, if you're going to go, uh, uh, you get about four miles to the kilowatt hour. And that kilowatt hour on average throughout the United States now with the complete mix is roughly uh, nine tenths of a pound per kilowatt hour or nine tenths of a pound for four miles, which would be four and a half uh, pounds for 20 miles. And if you have a 20 mile per gallon car, and you, if you do the math, the electric cars, buses and trains are roughly 80% cleaner using electricity that's made by predominantly natural gas. So I hope that that uh, is kind of what you were uh, getting at with that uh, question. And I'm glad you asked it because it's an important thing to observe. Uh, nobody claims, you know, uh, it, no matter what you do, if you're going to make something, there's going to be some energy involved in making it. So the question is, what's your energy return on investment? Um, and, and we'll be taking a look at some of the economics of that as we go, because if it weren't economically attractive, then not very many people, no matter what, they'll just take their chances. And if the planet heats up and melts, uh, that's just tough luck. We couldn't afford to fix it. But fortunately, we can't afford not to fix it. So, um, and, uh, Chris, you're welcome. I hope that did, uh, Okay, now here's what's exciting, and this is why I want to live for at least another seven years. Notice this is this historic worldwide consumption by energy source. You notice those three lines on top, that's sheer petroleum, coal, and natural gas. And they were rising slowly. Notice also you've got a logarithmic scale, so this is a semi-log plot. So uh, going up just a little bit and at top uh, row is actually quite a lot because we're talking about quads, which is 10 to the 15 or quad, 10, uh, a quadrillion uh, BTUs. But notice the important one on here is this green line with the stars on it, because that is all other renewable energy. Photovoltaics, wind, um, But, but not hydro, okay? It do, does re include, I'm sorry, I've got a leg that's driving me nuts today. Uh, good old sciatica. And, and it's, it's getting in the way of my thinking. Um, geothermal, there, I quit trying to think about geothermal and then it came to me uh, as being another important uh, uh, resource uh, for people who have it. Uh, let's see, here's the Q&A. And here we're talking about worldwide consumption. 
as opposed to the United States consumption. And the question is, yes, we take into account that year by year, worldwide consumption tends to go up in terms of BTUs, but we saw that utility production of, of kilowatt hours, which can equate to BTUs because uh, one kilowatt hour is 3,413 BTUs. And, and so as the production goes up and the production of CO2 goes down, it's taking into account. Of course, now the increase in use of electricity is not necessarily directly proportional to the increase in population because as we get more efficient, the per capita use goes down. So anyway, this is what some of the scenarios might look like beyond <clears throat> where we are today. And once that green line passes that 100 quad mark, it's going to be displacing a lot of these things on the top, like the petroleum, like the natural gas, like the coal. And we know that it's happening already with the coal. And we look at the next half of this decade, and it's going to be some really interesting stuff to keep an eye on. And a lot of us just may have something to do with that. Another question. Electric car batteries, life recycling, da-da, da-da, da-da. Um, yeah, here's, here's the thing on uh, electric cars. I get this question all the time. It takes an electric car two years to make up for the additional uh, uh, CO2 involved in, uh, in the manufacture of that car versus another car. And from then on, you're at that 20% uh, mark where it's only polluting 20% as much as its friend uh, that burns gasoline. So uh, this, this is something you can look up. Uh, uh, just just uh, a lot of these answers are fairly straightforward on, on the web. So uh, I hope that is what you're asking, Gary, because that, that's a story that, uh, yes, it, uh, of course, there's a lot of other things about electric cars that uh, maintenance is a whole lot less. I can attest to that. Um, electric car people, who owners will say, yes, it's likely that my tires wear out a little bit faster. But if we compare that with all the other maintenance money that I save, and uh, by the way, um, I'm driving my car for two cents a mile. And uh, if I were had we're driving it on gasoline, it would be more like 10 cents a mile. So, so the cost of driving the car is, is significantly less than, than driving gasoline vehicle uh, of comparable size and performance. Well, maybe not performance. The Teslas will make a Mustang look, uh, well, anyway, that's getting a little off, off base here. But uh, those of you who have had rides in tes Teslas, my stomach kind of went up right up to my throat the first time a friend uh, decided to step on the gas. So, yeah, uh, a lot of myths about electric car batteries. In fact, we have an entire two-hour webinar that we do on uh, electric vehicle charging. If you're interested, uh, not sure when the host has uh, got that on the list for the next time, but I think he's got a recorded copy if you wanted to watch that. Um, so, Anyway, you see, you see the possibility we have here right around 2029. And so another seven years would make me 87. And if I can make that 87, I'm going to be able to tell whether this prediction is, is, is uh, happening within a year or so. So this is what we're looking at. This is the opportunity we're looking at. Notice this is... <laughs> Compiled by BP Statistical Review of World Energy. I mean, the, the blue and the black and the green lines beyond the data points are mine as, as possible projections. But we're simply subtracting the green contribution from the contributions from the blues and the blacks. And, uh, well, we're going, we'll see what happens. Uh, most of us probably be around for that. Another question. I think fine EV breaks even within six to 18 months, depending on the grid. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So, and, and it's getting better. Just like photovoltaic cells, uh, their energy payback time used to be somewhere in a matter of uh, six or eight years. It's now down to about two years. 
so so yeah uh, not only are people installing these but people are making these things a whole lot better so yeah thanks for pointing it out david uh, that was even a very uh conservative two years because pretty much all of them can do better than the two-year payback on them thank you very much for pointing that out Okay, uh, we've been on this picture here for quite a while. Let's move on to another one. And here is the fun part about being an engineer. You can draw your own scenario. And this is one I drew just for the heck of it. What if we decided to reduce the amount of CO2 generated by transportation electric generation industry by that constant amount that you see. Every one of those orange bars drops by the same amount, which is something like drops down from 3.6 to about 3.2, about 0.4 gigatons a year. If we can make that happen by 2029, those sectors will be clean and green, all right? And uh, we've left the blue for everybody else, and we're not expecting them to do anything. But if we can do that, we're down to about the, almost the 20% level. So that's one scenario. And it's fun to draw scenarios. And uh, here's another one. We're going to figure that these people in the blue boxes, uh, they want to cut their consumption a little bit as well. All right, and you see where we are at 2029. There's still some production by the guys in blue, but the transportation like generation and industry are going away. Well, that's not going to happen probably, but uh, what I'm going to do next though is we're going to figure out how much it would cost to do this. Because after all, why do it if we don't benefit somehow and from a cost savings, whatever. And here's another scenario that's even more aggressive, scenario three. And uh, which gets down to in 2029 at the 10% level of where we were at in 2020. Um, whether we can do it or not, matter of determination, but we're going to take a look at this third scenario now and see what it would cost to do that. All right, here's some economic. First challenge is transition all the electrical generation to renewables. And here's what we need to do that. We know exactly what the problem is. We, that's pretty well defined. We got 1.15 trillion kilowatt hours that has to be replaced with renewables. With natural gas, we got 1.47 trillion kilowatt hours per year. And uh, of course we can't just use solar and wind because uh, they're more intermittent. So we're going to have enough have to have enough storage out there so that between clouds and between night and day, uh, we will have enough kilowatts of storage to keep. And, and notice the difference here between kilowatts and kilowatt hours because uh, we kind of look at kilowatts that we use at night. And that's going to take about 100 million kilowatts at night in order to fill the gaps between the uh, the hydro and the nuclear and the solar that is not being generated at night versus what's generated during the day. And to some extent during the day as well, although in some cases the storage will actually store excess energy produced by wind and solar and, and uh, uh, renewables during the day, uh, like in the afternoon, everybody turns off their office lights and goes home at five o'clock. There's a, a slight dip in the demand. And if the generation facilities are pumping out electricity, they may need some storage in order to just save that extra electricity so it can be used at night. It's really interesting to, to, to imagine what, what the situation can be. Eliminating coal, that's another 716 million kilowatts of renewables. And uh, did I say kilowatts? Um, well, it depends on the renewables because a kilowatt of renewables makes a certain number of kilowatt hours. So in any case, and that, that's why we, we, we talk about uh, uh, 
we're replacing the kilowatt hours, okay? But the question is, uh, how are we going to replace those kilowatt hours? And the way we replace 1.15 trillion kilowatt hours is by installing 716 million kilowatts of renewables because those 716 million kilowatts will produce that 1.15 trillion kilowatt hours in a year's time. All right, and this is using just photovoltaics. And the mix will, of course, not be just photovoltaics. There'll be a significant amount of wind and additional amounts of uh, uh, other renewables as well. And right now, the production of renewables is about 80% at utility scale and about 20% at residential scale. And it's cheaper to make electricity at the utility scale than at the residential scale if you don't count the value of the land. Uh, well, in some case, even the utility scale does pay for rent on the land. Uh, and so a lot of farmers who are uh, growing electricity rather than uh, growing whatever else they might have grown because they're getting old and tired of sweating out in the fields. But in any case, bottom line here, it uh, costs about $215 billion a year to replace the coal in a 10-year period. And getting rid of the natural gas in a 10-year period, we're looking at about $275 billion a year for 10 years. All right, so between coal and natural gas, and that's what makes electricity, um, well, uh, this is under 500 billion a year, isn't it? 75 and 15 is 90, 490 billion dollars a year, most of which will be investment, well, at least 70% of which will be investment from the private sector, maybe, maybe a little less than that if the government spends a lot of money on government buildings. And so, how does that compare with other expenditures? Well, guess what? The US GDPs somewhere in 23 trillion annual. And the military budget is 700 billion, which is uh, 200 billion more than what we're proposing to solve the most aggressive scenario of replacing the coal and the natural gas used to make most of the electricity that's responsible for essentially all of the pollution. So uh, can we afford it? And the, the question actually comes to, can we afford not to? And I, I don't even remember whether I kept that slide in this, but maybe at the end of the, the slide, we'll take a look uh, at the, the program. I think we have a slide that shows what happens if we don't. But anyway, this is what it will cost if we do. And this is with today's money, today's prices. And, you know, the cost of batteries is going down. The cost of photovoltaic modules is going down. The cost of electronics components of these systems is going down just like the cost of tv sets and cell phones and whatever so this is based on today's dollars as well so it's interesting uh where we might go with this let's see where'd my cursor go there it is question came up uh do i have any data on the rest of the world's net increase in fossil fuel usage um I have, I, I don't have data on the rest of the world's net increase in fossil fuel usage. I do have data on the rest of the world's increase in renewable use. And the rest of the world increase in renewable use is something like a, matter, a factor of five higher than the adoption of renewables in the United States. Um, China's still burning a lot of coal, but they are working like crazy to eliminate that. They're building wind and, and, and solar and storage as fast as they can possibly get it out of the ground. Um, so uh, we are playing catch up in a lot of cases. Costa Rica, Norway, almost 100% renewable. So uh, there, there's some, we, we, there's some spots in the world that are not as good as us. Europe is way ahead of us. And, and in terms of their effort to get rid of the coal, China is moving very quickly. So we'll, we'll see what happens there, but that doesn't give us an excuse for not doing it because of, again, because I keep talking about the economics and we'll be there uh, as an explanation on this. 
So again, thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, there may be a point where, well, some of these I'm saying we're going to have the answer as we move on here. So what about energy storage? We said we're going to have to have a fair amount of storage. This is, happens to be a 100 megawatt storage facility. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100 megawatt and 129 megawatt hour storage facility in South Australia. And this facility was built in less than 100 days back in 2017. And you can see there's a lot of windmills there and wind can, if the wind stops blowing a little storage helps a lot to stabilize the grid. They were having grid stability problems and this is an amazing job. Uh, here's some data on it. Uh, there, there's a lot of energy storage, uh, pumped hydro, compressed air. Uh, pumped hydro is by far the, the uh, largest uh, uh, there's a whole lot more pumped hydro uh, kilowatt hour and kilowatt capacity out there than any other storage method at the moment. Uh, something like 90% of it is pumped hydro. But the others are coming up fast. Compressed air, there are really only two uh, commercial operations in the world, one in the United States, one in Europe. Um, capacitors, flywheels, at least 10 different battery technologies, the electric vehicle excess battery capacity. Uh, let's say that you're plugged your electric vehicle in when you're at work, it's four o'clock, your batteries are fully charged in the EV. It's gonna take you five kilowatt hours to get home to drive that uh, 20 miles home, but you've got a hundred kilowatt hours in your battery pack and the utility calls up, dials into your car online, not really online, maybe, who knows, the communication technology, and ask your car, hey, um, how about sharing five kilowatts with me just between four and five? And your car will say, well, what are you going to pay me? And they negotiate uh, a rate that uh, helps pay for the batteries in the car. Um, and, and, and all this uh, happens within, say, 100 milliseconds or so, uh, automatically, as long as the utility and the owner have signed some form of agreement. So this, this gets really fascinating, bi-directional electric vehicle charging and having electric vehicles parked at the garages where people work or at home during the day, talking to the utility and providing electricity to the til utility when the utility asked for it. And this has been something that's been on the book since 2018 with IEEE 1547-2018, which sets the standard for that. So interesting. Uh, lifting cement or steel, that's another storage like lifting water. And in fact, they're getting away from lifting cement because of the energy intensity of cement and steel for that matter. And they're making bricks out of, out of uh, clay and other things over in Europe. Look up uh, uh, LWF, lift, let, um, lifting weight storage uh, online, and you'll see what they're doing in Europe with this. And uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, anything that's commercial means it's cost effective. Nobody does anything unless it pays for itself. So that's important to know. I see there's a couple questions. Right now, storage costs are around $125 per kilowatt hour. The cost is coming down a bit. And uh, again, storage has kilowatts and kilowatt hours because it's the kilowatts that you're using on an instantaneous basis. And every storage source has a limit to the number of kilowatts that can be developed at any instant uh, in the discharge cycle. And if it's lithium, you generally, if you have a 10 kilowatt hour uh, storage with lithium, your kilowatts is typically going to be more like four kilowatts available, and then it's current limited. So uh, it's neat to know that, that you're storing energy that's in kilowatt hours, but you're 
you're, you're taking it out in terms of kilowatts, that is the rate at which you remove it from the storage. And that's, of course, how people use it is the kilowatts. Let's look at the questions. Let's see, is there a way to estimate how much storage area is required per unit of energy? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, every uh, storage source, you can look this up. I don't have any of it memorized. Uh, batteries is kind of in the middle. Uh, but but just, just just Google, pick one of those storage methods and, and say how many acres per megawatt, and it will give you an answer on that, uh, just like whether it's for, uh, and, and you know, the numbers are, are, are reasonable. All right, that's the important thing. And if you can stack these things so that they're tall buildings rather than spread out all over the place, uh, then you can get more megawatts per acre uh, by simply stacking things up, just like a, an apartment building or a tall condominium or office building or New York City or something like that. You get more bang for the buck if you go upwards. And that can happen with certain kinds of storage as well. Uh, so let's see. Globally, the world has store more renewables than fossil fuels for the last five years. Absolutely correct, David. Last year, 84% of new electricity was renewables. Absolutely right. David, you must be in the business. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you having that, that, that data handy because, yeah, that's exactly uh, what's been had. More renewables, not necessarily more PV, but when you add all the, the, the three main renewables, uh, it, 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 they're, you know, all renewables, it's, it's way ahead of fossil. So the utilities, they've got their act together pretty well. Uh, they understand where the money is. Uh, and uh, when, when the utility can make electricity for three cents a kilowatt hour with potable takes, they're not going to turn that down, especially when it costs them more with uh, other types. Uh, something like four or five cents for natural gas. And, and so on. And again, these are numbers that are available and some of them we'll come across as we move on through here. The, these breaks are when I click all the different things that I have to do to turn off the, the question box. So storage is an interesting thing because when you say you've got 100 megawatt hours of, uh, I'm sorry, when you say you have 129 megawatt hours of storage, <clears throat> that's kind of misleading because that means you've got that. You can, uh, depending on your rate of discharge, if you can discharge all 129 of those in a day's time, which is, the so-called C over 24 discharge rate, which you can do with anything. Um, that means you can fill them up again the next day and do it again and do it 365 days a year. So, and, and that's that many megawatt hours per day of being able to store and give back again. And uh, that, that that's something that uh, is not necessarily realized. And of course, then there's a lifetime of the storage and, uh, again, that most of those economics look pretty good, but otherwise you would not be seeing commercial huge systems like this out there. Uh, Florida Power and Light here in Florida has a 300 megawatt system, the second largest storage in the in the country, as far as I know, maybe even in the world. Um, and those guys don't play games; that they don't see profits, they don't do it. So. So what would it cost to have four hours of storage at 100 million kilowatts? The Holiday Inn Club, how about that? I keep my phone nearby so I can see what time it is. Um, so the cost of four hour storage at 100 million kilowatts, let's look, take a look at what that might be. You saw some of the different large storage there. Um, so four hours 
of storage at 100 million kilowatts was 400 million kilowatt hours. $125 per $50 billion on a daily basis. When the grid has extra energy, you store it and you give it back when the grid needs the power, whether that's during peak load time, whether it's nighttime, whenever it is, the storage, one of the biggest components of the storage system is the communication link with the utility so they can decide when the storage should be storing electricity and when it should be giving it back to the utility grid. And uh, <clears throat> clearly there's going to have to be short term and long term. If a cloud comes over the sun, you need a little short term. If you need to store some additional electricity that the utility is making while they're shutting one of their conventional plants down, then you want to store that. On the other hand, at night, that's a little bit longer term. You need storage for 12 hours in order to make sure that you've got enough, if you're talking about solar, to make it through the night. So the storage, lots of different ways to do it. You can do it in your own uh, the, the system I worked on this morning. They have 30 kilowatt hours of storage, and along with their 50 megawatts of uh, or 50 kilowatts of, of uh, generation capacity uh, for a house. And uh, so that, that's your local house with 30 kilowatt hours of storage, but you could build something on that vacant lot down the street maybe at uh, and, and have say 3000 kilowatt hours or 300 kilowatt hours, depending on the, the space, or it can be regional. Uh, you know, there are pictures in South Carolina of a uh, uh, solar field with storage right alongside of the photovoltaic sources. So interesting stuff. And here's where I was talking about the electric vehicles, what they can do. Um, they could provide if one. I mean, there's something like 180 million vehicles on the road here in the United States. So let's say we have 100 million. It's expected that there will be 18 million electric vehicles on the road in the United States by 2030. So by 2040, there likely will be 100 million. And if each can contribute five kilowatts and five kilowatt hours for an hour a day, that's 500 million kilowatts and 500 million kilowatt hours of storage, which would be there anyway, because it's it, it's going to be there in the electric cars and people are buying them like hotcakes. So the fact that the technology is developing, people see that there's profits and boy, do they put money into research. So, okay. What else is there out there? Let's talk about zero energy buildings, okay? Uh, who knows? Maybe the one that burned down at this site will come back as a zero energy. Here's the deal. You got site boundary, and then you got a building. Maybe it's a campus. Maybe it's a neighborhood. Who knows what? But it's something that uses energy. And within that site boundary, you produce renewable energy. You read about this happening a lot. Michigan universities, for example, have been installing large amounts of uh, photovoltaics in the form of uh, uh, canopies for parkings over parking spaces. And uh, <clears throat> so they're generating a lot of renewable energy. <clears throat> the whole idea is to generate at least as much renewable energy as your site uses and the problem is it's not necessarily a perfect ma match between when the energy is generated and when it's being used. So you're going to have to have a connection to delivered energy as well. Unless you've got an awful lot of storage and an awful lot of production. But you've got the delivered energy, but then you also sell back an amount equal to the amount delivered. And everything that you sell back to to the grid is going to be renewable energy at zero kilo or zero uh, pounds of uh, CO2. So this is a definition of a zero energy building. It's not that the building or the site doesn't use energy. It's just that it's a net zero energy site. And if every site were like this, uh, we'd be in pretty good shape. So, um, a few numbers. Uh, how do you do this? Now, first of all, we talked about source energy in those uh, pictures earlier on. 
and uh, and those graphs, uh, the pie charts, and uh, there are factors involved. Uh, for example, in order to make electricity, uh, for, for every kilowatt hour of electricity you generate, it takes three times that in source energy, primary energy. Uh, in other words, the energy available in say coal oil uh, or, or whatever. And uh, these are numbers agreed upon by the folks who, uh, uh, you know, all that National Renewable Energy Labs and the places that, that do this kind of stuff for a living. And uh, so that means that if the import of electricity has a source energy conversion factor of 3.15, it's only fair to give that same factor to exported renewable energy because the electrons don't know the difference. Natural gas 1.09, why so much lower than 3.15? Well, natural gas is usually used for direct heating, except for the electricity. But if natural gas is used for direct heating, the losses are relatively small, water, heater, whatever. Uh, kerosene fuel oil, again, for heating a building, mostly heat gets uh, dumped into the building. Same with propane and liquids and steam, a little more losses if you're using steam for heat. <clears throat> Same thing with hot water, chilled water, not so much, coal or other source energy conversion factor. If you're burning coal to for heating, uh, the, the heat, you know, a steel factory, for example, if you're going to burn coal to melt steel or melt iron or to, to, to refine iron, um, you're going to capture most of that heat. So you've got a 1.05 factor. So it's making electricity where you have a lot of heat loss. Okay, so how do you estimate it? Well, let's do an example. There's numbers. You need some conversion factors. What's a BTU? Raise temperature of pound of water by a degree Fahrenheit. Everybody knows that. Kilowatt hours, 3413 BTUs. Everybody knows that if they remembered I said it earlier. And a therm is 100,000 BTUs. Barrel of oil, 42 gallons. Okay, the numbers are there. So what about it? What do we do with this stuff? Well, we make a list of all the energy sources and estimated use. And then we convert everything to source energy equivalents if we want to design a zero energy building. So let's do an example. Who knows? Maybe this building they'll want to rebuild, redo it. There's a, an example of uh, why you, this forest can't burn anymore. It's pretty well already burned. So maybe that's why we're not having as many, losing as much forest because we've already lost a whole lot. Um, and it simply hasn't come back yet. Uh, now, I'm guessing that that's the reason, uh, because the conditions haven't really changed for the fires to uh, to burn. Anyway, let's go through this example. And let's uh, fairly typical small 1,500 square foot building uh, using 7,500 kilowatt hours of electricity and 500 therms of purchased natural gas. So we convert the electricity to BTUs. And that's 25,597,500.0. Convert the electric BTUs to source energy, multiply it by 3.15. And we get a number in the 80 million range. <clears throat> Convert the natural gas into source energy, another 54 million BTUs uh, and change. <clears throat> Add the two and we are up to 135 million, 132, 125, about. Of source energy. Okay, to make it work. So now we want to offset that source energy. So how do we offset that source energy with PV electricity? And you know, I say PV just because that's what I do, but there's no reason why it can't be wind, it can't be geothermal or any other renewable source. Okay. Uh, so Determining the size of the PV array. Um, a reasonable number to use is 1500 kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year. Uh, that is if you deploy a kilowatt or a thousand watts of photovoltaic. Uh, and if it's facing south at approximately a uh, tilt of latitude, it ought to make 1500 kilowatt hours uh, a year unless it's shaded badly. Okay, 
And so therefore, that's your base number, and you can find out exactly how many kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year for whatever orientation you might have where you are using a simulation program that's free for everybody uh, from the National Renewable Energy Labs called SAM, System Advisory Model. Just Google NREL SAM. I've got that here on the slide somewhere, so we'll come to that. Uh, computing the BTUs to kilowatt hour, kilowatts per year. Um, this is uh, 1,500 kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year. Uh, is the same as 5,119,500 BTUs per year per kilowatt. All right, that's 100% efficiency conversion. But uh, that's what we're doing here because uh, the 1,500 is actually what we have after all losses are taken into account. So now we're just changing the units. All right, now we've got uh, converted source energy multiplied by 3.15. So every thousand watts of kilo of, of uh, photovoltaics on a roof is going to give you 16 million and change of uh, BTUs per year. So now we know how many we need from the previous analysis. So 8.38 kilowatts will do the job to make to balance out all that source energy. The average residential job that uh, the company I work for does is about 11 kW. Now one might say, well, what about the electric car? And in fact, uh, if you're gonna add an electric car to the mix, um, well, here's some more numbers here for, for, for how much area this is gonna take. And uh, we're looking at about 200 watts per square meter. And so we'll need about 451 square feet of solar on a roof. <clears throat> and that's about 28 modules. The uh, residential system I looked at this morning at 132 modules, I think. So it was a little bit bigger house. But 28 modules will fit on almost any roof, unless it's a, a, a really a contortion of 12 different roof planes or something that angle off in all directions. Um, so you check the module dimensions, see how they fit. And... Uh, if you want to add electric vehicle to the mix there, that's going to take about another 1,500 watts per electric vehicle, average driving of about 10,000 miles a year. So uh, pretty much every roof out there has got enough roof space for that, as long as it's not totally shaded by a forest or something like that. And we don't want to burn down the forest just to make room for the PV system. Let's look at heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. Here's a neat little system. <clears throat> this happens to be an inverter technology heat pump. Heats or cools. It can work down to minus 13 Fahrenheit. And the seasonal energy efficiency ratio of this thing is up to 33.1. And by now there might even be some higher. A friend of mine in North Carolina, they just installed one of these. And you sit eating your breakfast toast and looking at your, your your remote that you can tell it exactly what you want it to do for temperature. So uh, back when Florida first adopted its code for energy efficiency in building construction, the minimum SEER for a air conditioner had to be eight. So here we're looking at four times more efficient in the air conditioning system. That's not bad at all. And then we got these things here. We got these... Uh, Come on, click. Where are we going? Oh, there it is. We've got energy recovery ventilators. And if humidity control is important, it's, a, it's a mere, mere, merely a uh, counter current heat exchanger. But as the uh, cool air goes out and the warm air comes in, the cool air causes the warm air humidity to condense out. And so you need a condensate drain on this thing. And rather than just pumping out cool air and pumping in outside air, you're taking, depending on whether you're doing heating or cooling because the process is, reserved, is, is uh, reversed for heating. And if you're pumping out warm air, then you're using that warm air to warm up the outside air before it gets inside. 
pretty simple. Any mechanical engineers know about uh, uh, these things from thermodynamics. They're roughly 90% efficient. So why not do that if you have a kind of a dwelling where you can do it? Uh, it, it so, so it, you know, you can't do this with everything. I wish I could do it with my unit here. But I'm on the fifth floor, and there's uh, 16 vent fans up on the roof of this building that are in 16 different locations where we would have to do our energy recovery ventilation. And it would be incredibly complicated to do that. But if you can do it, uh, this is pretty, pretty handy. And if you don't need to get the moisture out, then you just get a heat recovery unit. And uh, again, county current uh, and uh, very effective. So combine these things with the super high SEER uh, uh, heat pumps and uh, you've got an incredibly efficient system. And then if you beef up your envelope, so that the heat losses from building envelope are minimal. And then you got LED lights instead of incandescent lights inside. So there's much less heat. So then the only problem is the people with their 600 BTUs per hour per person, half uh, latent and half, uh, now I'm forgetting again, but, but ha half of it is humidity and half of it is temperature. Uh, you get people who don't dance inside, just, just sit around quietly. Anyway, domestic water heating, big difference. <clears throat> Solar water heating is uh, has been extremely popular. But now there's another product on the market that's competing with solar water heating. And that's simply a heat pump water heater, which are sometimes called a, a hybrid water heater. But if you use just the heat pump uh, in the heat pump water heater, then it has about a three and a half coefficient of performance. So for every kilowatt hour of electricity, you put three and a half kilowatt hours of heat into the water. Well, that's a pretty nice deal. And and uh, if you live in Florida and if you where water heaters in the garage, where does that heat come from that you put into the water? It comes out of your garage. So you actually cool your garage a bit as well. Not a whole lot, because if you figure out the size of the garage and the total amount of BTUs you put into water in a day, uh, but it does take some of the heat and the humidity out of the garage as well. Um, so now, <clears throat> whether you put a solar water heater or a domestic or a heat pump or whatever, you do the math. You got to figure it out. Because if you have a solar water heater, for example, but you only live there for nine months out of the year, that's three months where you're not getting any payback from the solar water heater because you can't sell it back to the utility. And your neighbor, well, maybe could come in and work out a deal, but uh, shower or, or something, but uh, probably not a lot of that's gonna happen. Whoops, I went too fast. There was a picture of one there. Let's see if we can get it back. I'm going to try to go back. There it is, 50 gallon water heating heat pump. <clears throat> and uh, it adds somewhere in the neighborhood of um, uh, 5,000 BTUs per hour uh, to, to the water. So it takes a little while longer for this to recover from hot water use. But if you can schedule your water use to give this unit time to recover, then uh, it's fine. And it does have a backup 4,500 or uh, 4,500 watt element in it <clears throat> in the event that you want water faster. And that's why it's called a hybrid water heater because you can give it full power if you need to heat your water faster. What are some of the trade-offs? Well, you make building more efficient and you don't need as much solar or wind or whatever other renewable. And that's pretty obvious. So you balance out the costs and see which is more expensive. And then uh, <clears throat> you do what makes sense. And that's what why engineers love math so much. And I've heard that even architects love math. 
So you do some math here and you decide what's the best deal. All right. And of course, it is interesting. PV, we always hear about PV facing south. And in fact, on a residence, you can make electricity your lifetime cost per kilowatt hour to pay for the, the system for south facing on residence about six cents a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> and uh, in order to, and, and of course, if, if your six cent amortization cost instead of a 15 cent utility bill, uh, that's a little less expensive. <clears throat> You can, if that array is facing north, you're going to lose one third. So uh, that, that means instead of six cents, it's nine cents a kilowatt hour. It's nine, maybe not even nine, one third. Oh, I'll do the math. Roger, you're wearing out here. Um, the point being that here in Florida and a lot of other places, even a north facing solar array now will pay for itself. And that's only the last few years since the prices come way down that that's been the case. So quite a surprise. You see a house that has photovoltaic modules facing four different directions, and they're all cost effective. It's amazing. If orientation is not optimal, you just increase the array size if you want to make that much electricity. And of course, if you consider an electric vehicle or two as part of the building load, then you just add a little more solar in order to uh, take care of that as well. Um, here's a question. Let's take a look before we move here. I often tell buyers they can buy eight solar panels from me to run their hot water heater, or they can install a heat pump water heater and two solar panels. Yeah, that's your four to one uh, uh, gain. Heat pump water heater cheaper than the six extra solar panels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking the heat pump water heater retail price somewhere around fifteen hundred dollars installed. Uh, your marginal cost about five hundred dollars to do the heat pump water heater. Do the math. How long does it take you to get your five hundred dollars back in water heating? Not long. And. There's six other solar panels can be used then if they're 400 watt uh, modules. My goodness, that's almost enough. That's 2,400 watts. You only need 1,500 watts to charge that electric vehicle. So you got some extra for something else, maybe two water heaters, who knows? David, I really, I'm really glad you came today. You've got some good stuff to contribute. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's look at Albany, and it's, we're, I've been talking about the orientation of an array. So we look at this 100, and that means at 30 degree facing south roof tilt, you get the most possible annual electricity you can get. That's where your annual maximum comes in. Not necessarily the summer maximum or winter maximum, but the total annual maximum. If we raise the tilt to 45 degrees, if you got a 12-12 roof, you only lose 1%. If you orient this 30 degree tilt, well, 25 degree tilt, say, to the east, you get 83% of that, so you lose 17%. And at today's prices, in terms of uh, how long it takes to pay back that 17%, that means you pay 17% extra, more or less, depending on how you evaluate your percent. And so, 17% more than six cents is uh, what, seven cents then? So even east facing is a good deal. You don't hesitate to put them on east facing roof, even in Albany. And the numbers are better in Florida. So just, just so you know that, there's a lot of stuff here I want to make sure everybody knows about. So here's the bottom line is the savings in energy costs versus the additional mortgage payment if you're going to build a new building. And of course, there's a lot of ways to pay for stuff, but one nice thing is to just throw it in on your mortgage payment. And so if you're going to do this in Atlanta, it's going to cost you an extra 19000 or so. It's going to save you 152 on your monthly electric bill, and it's going to cost you an extra 100 bucks on your mortgage. 
All right. And again, these are very straight numbers that you can evaluate for wherever you happen to be. And your energy savings is going to be dependent on the amount of energy use, but also on the rate that your local utility is charging. And there's some places where local utilities are charging a whole lot more than others. TVA, there's still, I understand, somewhere down 11 or 12 cents. Down here in Florida, uh, residential rates somewhere around 15 cents. I understand up in the Northeast, it's closer to 20 now, even though you got a fair amount of Canadian hydro coming in. So anyway, it, it's a winning deal to do the math here and do what makes sense in terms of energy efficiency improvements versus, and, and then add to that whatever necessary renewable energy you need in order to zero it out. And here's six examples. You can do one for your city, like over the weekend while you're watching a football game, game during the, the halftime or something. All right, so what about efficiency retrofits and electrification? Let's also look at the clock here. 327. We've got half an hour to go. Okay. Actually, 36 minutes, given when we started. So we've been talking about efficiency retrofits, and, and I don't have to uh, tell anybody in this group that uh, almost every building out there can be made a little bit greener. <clears throat> but there's a lots of them, millions of buildings that can be made greener, meaning they use less energy, meaning that's less energy we need to produce. So meaning that even if we have an increase in population in buildings, if the buildings are more efficient, we can reduce the per capita energy use and the total energy use can stay the same or actually go down, even the population goes up. So that gets interesting. And as you can see, a lot of this stuff can be replaced by renewable energy equipment, heating stuff, refrigeration, all this stuff. A whole lot more efficient stuff out there now than there was 10 to 15 years ago. LED lights, looking at 150 lumens per watt and up compared to 15 lumens per watt with incandescent. And a lot of the buildings out there were built, this three watts per square foot thing were based on incandescent light bulbs, not LEDs. So how many houses, and those, the electricals out there who are doing load calcs for houses and other buildings with the three watts per square foot thing, there aren't very many buildings out there anymore that use three watts per square foot. Better doors and windows. Boy, when we put in our hurricane windows and doors here, it made a huge difference in terms of heat loss and noise control. And our insurance rates went down. Plug up those air leaks. Replace, but, but don't avoid air exchanges because there's a whole lot healthier air inside if you've got those energy recovery ventilators or heat recovery ventilators in there. But don't let it just leak in with the all outdoor enthalpy when you can let it leak in and be brought in at an enthalpy that's a whole lot closer to what you've got inside. Um, upgrade the insulation, landscaping. Wow, there's some pretty smart uh, watering systems out there now uh, that, that not only do they pay attention to how much it rains, they pay attention to whether the particular area is in the shade and then pay attention to the temperature in the season of the year because they're in spring and fall, you don't need as much water as you do in the summer if it gets really hot with a lot of direct sunlight. So, wow, there's some neat stuff. And then what you use, whether it's grass, whether it's water efficient or otherwise, is a whole lot of things can be done in landscaping. And you wouldn't do them unless they were cost effective. That's the, the interesting thing. And that's why people can make money doing these because people can see the advantage. And it's always nice when people do it just because it's the right thing to do. But when you can do the right thing and save a bundle of money at the same time, how can you lose on a deal like that? I was thinking of uh, going to divinity school, but I get used to preaching. But I, I get carried away sometimes here because when I think of I've been doing this for almost 50 years now, 
started in 1975 with energy efficiency stuff and have been working on these sort of things ever since. And and th that's why I tend to get excited about it because I, I remember what we had back then and I see what we have now and I see where we can go. And it gives me enthusiasm that if we all get on board, we can get this thing right <clears throat> and leave a decent future for our children and grandchildren. There's some nice computer programs out there because then you don't have to guess. You let the computer do it for you. You just in, enter good data. All right, and here's some of them. They, they can analyze the building envelope, building equipment, the cost effectiveness. One of them is National Renewable Energy Labs Building Energy Optimization, BEOPT. Just Google NREL BEOPT and see if you can download a copy of this if you're interested in this, okay? Um, and and it, it works for single or multifamily and new or retrofit. If you want to add a new something, it'll tell you, helps you do the math on this. Uh, Florida Solar Energy Center has a program called Energy Gauge USA, and that has two versions. And uh, you can download that and have a one month free trial with it. <clears throat> now, I, I did that, and I've been on FSEC advisory board for the last 30 years or so. And uh, uh, they they might have been able to find a way that I could keep a version, but uh, I, I just wanted to try it because I don't do much energy efficient stuff, efficiency stuff anymore, but it's there for anybody who wants it. And if you wanted to try it on your place just to see how it works, you get a free version for a month. Um, so... Now, why, why aren't these, and, and the reason you, you have to pay for these is that the, the funding for these agencies does not necessarily cover everything they do. They need to get their own grant money in from various things. And so anyway, uh, but NREL SAM is totally free. And that's what does the solar analysis for you for uh, photovoltaics. And it's a lot of fun to play with that program. That one, if I have, if I get bored, I uh, definitely, uh, play with Sam, and that's where I get all these numbers comparing north, east, west, south, various tilts from a simulation, holding everything constant except for the orientation or the azimuth of the system. Um, let's talk about vehicles and fossil fuels for a little while. We started. Let's get some numbers on it now. Oh, wait a minute. What time we got? 3.34. Doing okay. Um, Burning gas, gallon of gasoline, 19.6. I'd said 20 earlier, but that's pretty round off, 20 pounds. In fact, about 10 years ago, the number that people were quoting was 22 pounds. So uh, uh, automobiles are getting a little more efficient at burning the gasoline. Um, so Coal generated electricity, here's your 2.2 .2 pounds I was talking about earlier. Natural gas generated electric electricity, here's the 0.9 pounds we talked about earlier. Here's a QA. Let's take a look, see what we got. Let's see, NREL SAM replace NREL. Uh, PV watts is one of the options you can use in SAM. Um, but what you can also do in SAM is use your specific equipment. You can tell it which modules you're using, which inverters you're using, uh, and, and what are your system components. And it has the data sheets in the program such that it compares uh, the temperature coefficients for production of power from the modules with the local weather. And uh, it, it, if you really want an accurate uh, uh, representation, you, you don't use the PV watts version. The PV watts is more of a generalized conservative estimate, and, and you can do better than if you decide. But sometimes you do PV watts just to get you started before you've even selected what your modules and your system components are going to be. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, PV watts is where it all started, and it's now a whole lot more sophisticated, but even PV watts is more, for, more sophisticated. So, yeah, download it copy you'll have fun and you can use the pv watts version to start with or if you've got some specific piece of equipment in mind 
punch them in. It's it's very intuitive to uh, run the program. Okay, so um, natural gas 0.9. So that's a big drop, isn't it? The uh, nine tenths of a pound per kilowatt hour, and and so uh, and gasoline. You, you can start comparing things now. And renewable generator electricity, no CO2 per kilowatt hour. So let's take a gasoline car average 25 miles per gallon. And let's, uh, that means every 100 miles you drive, you dump about 80 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. An electric car, at three or four miles to the kilowatt hour. We've mentioned that before. So that means, uh, if electric car is using natural gas electricity, then uh, it's going to dump 25 pounds of CO2. The car didn't do it, but the electric company did for 100 miles driven. So we're talking 80 pounds versus 25 pounds. All right, and that, that's that's you know that's not too bad. And as the grid gets more efficient and more renewable. The electric cars, the equivalent electricity is going to come much closer to solar electricity. And of course, if you put solar electric on your house, then you can argue that your every 1500 watts is going to give you 10,000 miles a year. So, of course, again, renewable energy for electric cars, no CO2 released at all. So yeah, you got a little extra re CO2 in a release in the production of them, maybe. But after, as a uh, gentleman mentioned soon, earlier, uh, that energy payback is less than two years and the CO2 payback, and then there's nothing. So here's a little comparison. Let's go 10,000 miles on renewable electricity. And uh, of course, zero, zero, 15, let's say 15 cents a kilowatt hour. You're going to use 3,000 kilowatt hours. You got $450 for refuel, no emissions. And the batteries are available for storage when a vehicle's at a charging station. If you have bi directional charging, not too many of the EVs have that right now, but it is coming on fast. The 2020. <clears throat> even the 2017 version of National Electric Code. No, I, not, maybe not. But for sure, the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code uh, provides for the possibility that an electric vehicle, if it has bi-directional charging, its inverter has to comply with UL 1741.8 um, uh, 2018. And, and not UL 1741, IEEE 1547-2018. Mm -hmm. Which simply says, if it's going to make electricity to sell back to the, the utility, it has to be utility quality. And most of these inverters are 3% total harmonic distortion. Utility allows 5%. So it's uh, this is electronics here. And it, it, it you can do a lot of really good stuff with electronics. Not sure you still use PV watts and find it. Oh, that's what I use all the time. I almost never go to... Uh, uh, whenever I use uh, try to do an estimate, I use PV watts <clears throat> because it's uh, like I say, it uh, exactly what you say. It's easy and quite accurate. So, uh, uh, excellent point, Dave. Uh, there's almost never, unless you're going to try financing a system, then you're going to want to try to uh, get as accurate as you possibly can because your contract might say that you're guaranteeing a certain number of kilowatt hours a year. And so then you're gonna get into one of the more expensive programs that takes into account the, the, the all, all kinds of stuff. And, and we have some financiers that where uh, we have to design their systems different because uh, they need to optimize their PV watts, otherwise they stand a chance of losing money. So again, good observation. Um, so here's your electric vehicle story, and here's your gasoline vehicle story. Ten thousand miles, twenty-five miles a gallon, four hundred gallons of gas, three dollars a gallon. Is that a joke? My daughter was just out in Reno 
Nevada area, and she sent me a picture of seven dollar a gallon gas. So you know you can put your local numbers in here. Uh, at four dollars a gallon, you're up to sixteen hundred, and that's about where we are around here right now, right around four. So this is a pretty conservative, cheap gas. That 400 gallons is going to release 7,840 pounds of CO2. And that's 3.56 metric tons. And there's 275 million of these things on the road. And that is 2.16 trillion pounds of CO2. And that's why on the road, simple automobiles have that large percentage of total CO2 that's generated, as was shown on that previous uh, previous uh, pie chart. Oh, I forgot to uh, click down on that. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> obviously the green side in terms of CO2 generation, but but riding in these EVs, they're extremely comfortable and very quiet. If you need a loud car, I, I have heard that they uh, that Tesla's come up with a noisemaker for their car, so that the uh, when they're side by side with 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 a, a Mustang, they can make as much noise as a Mustang, or maybe they play music or whatever they do, but they do something to make noise. Um, and of course, if you're backing up an electric car and somebody's behind you, uh, they're probably not going to hear you. So it doesn't hurt to have a little music or something playing so that uh, people will know you're there. Uh, you probably think I'm sold on electric cars, but well, yeah, you'd be right on that because uh, we love ours. It's, it's a fine way of getting around. Um, other forms of travel, electric trucks, buses, trains, they're already here. There's your lion. Here's another passenger, here's truck, there's your Tesla pickup truck. Oh boy, is that a pickup truck or what? And electric trains, yeah, they're here. So, uh, and, and, and they're catching on. Uh, Florida was presumably gonna buy a bunch of electric school buses. I haven't heard progress on that, whether they've done that or not yet, but so they did get some money on a settlement with, uh, Volkswagen when they uh, made some false claims on their diesel engines. Uh, I've seen a number of others. And then there's smaller stuff out there too. There's these things and these things and these things and these things and these things. And you can imagine what somebody riding on a Harley would think about that one in the upper right. <clears throat> but uh, the way I don't even have here other than a, a, a little electric uh thing is these uh, electric bikes are going like crazy. Uh, New York City, I've heard that in Amsterdam, uh, most of the streets downtown are just electric bikes. So uh, it's amazing. Uh, somebody clicked on chat. I'm going to see what that is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, what kind of electric car? Um, well, we bought in 2018 so we got a plug-in hybrid and uh it, it's a honda clarity uh, because there weren't a whole lot of public uh, charging stations out there and we wanted to make sure we could drive to orlando if we wanted 200 miles but it turns out most of our driving now is local 15 miles a day or so and that's we got 50 gallon 50 miles a day on electric so we don't come anywhere close to running low unless we drive to the airport or something like that <clears throat> But uh, I mean, every electric car I've been in, I've, I've enjoyed the ride. So, uh, so yeah, that uh, it would help though uh, to keep the comments in the Q and A if you could. On um, time check, three forty six. We're doing fine. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, an assortment of other electric transportation is out there, and these are all on-road vehicles. So they all, all of the uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, charging definitions and so forth of NEC 425 apply to these vehicles. So 
how much additional renewable energy for 275 million electric vehicles? You now, we hinted at that earlier. What are we going to do to keep this BMW i3 on the road? Um, well, and I've already answered this question. Uh, it's going to take roughly 1,500 kilowatt hours. Well, if you want 2,500 kilowatt hours per year per vehicle, then you can do that with about 1,500 watts extra of PV, depending on the orientation. But again, use your PV watts out of an NREL SAM to figure that out. And you can do that tonight by downloading it if you wanted to. But here, with 688 billion kilowatt hours, is the bottom line here. And we already know what it takes to replace coal and natural gas for non-vehicular loads. So why should it be any different for vehicular loads? So at 4.9 trillion for 1634 billion, uh, we only have 608, 688 billion, and that's only 1.3 trillion, which is 130 million a year. Most of this to be borne by the individual consumer less the 30% investment tax credit on the purchase of the renewable energy source, whatever that might be. So this is not even money the government's spending, maybe 30% of it, but the rest of it is coming out of our pockets and we're still saving a bundle as a result of it. So 130 billion a year. Now, that's if we don't, make things more efficient. And that, that that's another, <laughs> uh, if, if anybody believes that we're not gonna become more efficient over the next 30 years, I've got a bridge for sale because uh, clearly the, the economics are favorable for it. <clears throat> so what about the grid? What are we gonna have to do? <laughs> oh, excuse me, to, redop, to adopt renewables. Um, we need storage. And we've talked about what it costs for storage. Simply because wind and photovoltaics are less predictable. All right. But over the long term, for a month or for a year, they're pretty predictable. You just can't do it on a daily basis because they can't predict next year's weather yet on a daily daily basis. But uh there's a lot of other stuff out there that have been commercialized, like flywheels. Not really su su super capacitors yet. The weightlifting things are commercially being adopted now slowly in certain European countries. And here's that statement about 100 million EVs. That's 600 million KWs and a billion kilowatt hours. That's a lot. That's that just people who own cars. Yes, it's possible your batteries will run down a little faster, but cost of batteries, performance of batteries going up. And furthermore, once your automobile battery is no longer useful for the automobile, it can be used in utility energy storage because the only reason you don't have it in your automobile is because you can't drain it quite as fast and get quite the acceleration and furthermore, losses in the battery, it's going to cost a little bit more. You won't get as many miles per kilowatt hour because you have more losses in the battery pack. Another question. Let's see what we got. Anonymous. An investment tax credit does not provide 30% tax credit or drug payment because of IRS. Um, you know, I'm not even totally, I know they're back up to 30% tax credit with the, uh, what's that called? The IRA, the Invest, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and it is possible that even uh, nonprofits can benefit from the 30% tax credit. Now, I don't know the answer for sure. There have been some changes, but they have been changes for the good so that people who wouldn't qualify just because they don't pay enough taxes in the first place can still get some kind of refund to help support the development. Uh, this is not going to stay forever, but it, it's not going to need to stay forever because it's already done its job of incentivizing the investment community to come up with stuff 
that competitively priced that people want to buy. So it's a good uh, good uh, observation. But uh, and and the answer is you should always look into what kind of tax credits or what what incentive payments might be available because there are a lot of local utilities, for example, that uh, have incentive payments that have nothing to do with investment tax credits. Okay. Um, we're looking at challenges to the grid. Well, another challenge is not just storage, but if you have so much renewable generator and energy available, and if it exceeds the demand of the load, it wants to go somewhere. And it might want to go to the generators themselves, the big 500 k or megawatt utility generator. And if you got a reverse power flow going to that generator, well, that that means it wants to turn it into a motor. And and the prime movers don't have don't 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 appreciate that a lot at all. So so therefore, um, all, all most of the power plants are protected from reverse power flows anyway. And the bottom bottom line is either you have to curtail your renewable source or you have to store it. And generally, the storage is a more cost effective solution. But the other thing is, the thing this is recognized and it's doable. Folks already know how to solve the problem. Uh, there's voltage amplitude stabilization at substation levels. And what that is saying here is that if the amplitude varies, then the taps at the substations might be moving up and down more than they otherwise normally would in order to maintain a relatively acceptable voltage level at the end of the transmission line, not the transmission, the distribution line. So uh, have to look for voltage amplitude stabilization, but with the energy management now that's also coming down line, uh, like gangbusters, I mean, energy management is, is really, and, and, and that's going to try to level out the loads period. Uh, they, I mean, they've been doing that with water heaters and swimming pool pumps and air conditioners for 40 years of uh, connecting up so that they can shut off your pool pump for 15 minutes in the afternoon to help reduce their demand. And it's, it's no big deal. The pool doesn't care. <clears throat> and the air conditioner or the water heater, for the most part, doesn't care. <clears throat> so, again, the solution to the substation level might be electronic taps instead of mechanical that don't arc, just like the inverters at the end of a high voltage DV transmission line, <clears throat> or DC transmission line. I better take a drink of water. So <clears throat> what will all this do to the grid? You maybe have an idea. What do we got here? Well, here's what we've got. <clears throat> right now, for the most part, we make electricity. We send it off to a bunch of substations where it's trans uh, the transmission levels, maybe 138,000 volts to minimize losses in transmission and use smaller wires. Go to the substation transform down into the 15,000 volt range, goes out into the neighborhood. And one transform might just have three loads on it. And there's another transformer up on a pole or a pad mount somewhere that has more loads. And then it goes to the local grocery store or the local manufacturing plant or something that has big load. And for the most part, <coughs> We're generating and using electricity, but here's where we're headed. A little more complicated. Still got the generation, I'm not gonna give that up, but it may be renewable instead of uh, fossil. And notice the, uh, in order to make sure the electricity just comes out of the generation, you've got that bi-directional link because at the substation, it's possible that there might be electricity heading back toward the generator. So the bi-directional link says, hey, 
you can't do that. You come to me instead, and I'm going to dump you into my big storage. But then when the generation is challenged, the generator talks to the bidirectional link set and says, hey, how much electricity you got in that big storage? Can I have some of it? We could really use it. And then there's also big storage, but then there might also be a big renewable, which could either go out to the substation or go around the loop and go into the big storage. And we're talking about the, the uh, hundreds of megawatts of uh, large uh, fields of, of solar or the huge wind farms that we saw in the previous picture. And then even at the substation, no reason why you can't have medium storage and medium renewables. And the renewables, they either add, they only add to the, to the, the system. The storage, you notice, all bi-directional. And then you go out to the neighborhood, and here's a load that has a baby PV system on their roof, but no storage. And then you got the, the neighbor across the street who's got a baby PV system, meaning 10 kW, 15, 20 maybe, and uh, maybe 10 or 20 or 30 kW hour, kilowatt hours of storage. And then there's no reason why you can't have somebody who just has storage with no renewables. And then you go to the neighborhood where the bigger store is with a little bigger load. And instead of having baby, baby size PV, they just have small size instead. The five-year-old, you know, instead of the two-year-old or the one-year-old and small storage. That's where the grid's going. And, and, and you can see some of these things starting to crop up now. So there's no question this is where it's headed. Uh, and it's just a matter of when. So keep your eyes open, folks. Uh, and then there's the government. What are they going to do? Well, let's don't forget that people are the government. That's what makes us so good and great and all. So they can green up their own buildings. They can green up government transportation. They can do incentives. They're doing a fair amount of that. Uh, charge your EVs at government buildings greening of military, green planning and development, you know, pretty logical stuff. They can save all of this tax money if they do it right. <clears throat> and strict zero energy building code requirements. I think within five years, they're going to see that. Uh, I know that some of the folks out in California are pushing for it now, and it may even be that uh, there are some zero energy building codes in some, some jurisdictions in California. I don't know. I, I just can't read everything that's coming around, but there's a lot of stuff out there. So, uh, and then, you know, you got incentives for renewables. There's no reason why we can't have additional incentives for zero energy renovations, as long as it uh, lowers our taxes or one way or another, or uh, if it lowers our expenses, then we can pay more taxes. Well, nobody wants to do that. Anyway, and then, of course, uh, there's uh, this kind of political here, but the whole idea is that uh, uh, this is what government is all about, is people protesting things and calling things to people's attention. So whether it's good or not, or whether you agree on it, it happens. And people pay attention to who lends to the fossil fuel companies. And it's public knowledge. So... Uh, um, and people, and, and, and there's some invest, uh, institutions that don't invest in fossil fuel. So these are choices people have, and they're both there. And I've got some money in, in, in utility, uh, in Florida Power and Light, uh, and my bank at Bank of America, because I've been doing it for the last 50 years. So... Uh, Sometimes uh, it's hard to change and get away from somewhere. Anyway, this just just so that you know, this is another thing that's going on. Uh, this on, was in the New York Times, uh, January twelfth, in twenty twenty. Um, oh, and here's the important one. This is the one that I wanted to see that I was talking about earlier, and I, I didn't remember whether it was in this presentation, but this. You see, the Paris Agreement conditions are, are, are represented by the green line, and not meeting the Paris Agreement conditions are represented by the red line. And 
this is a group of economists who did this work. I mean, you can see the source here, long-term um, macroeconomic effects of climate change. And, and this, this is, came out of uh, Scientific American in November 2019. So, you know, we're not playing games here. These are reputable people doing the math. And look at the United States. If we don't get on board here and meet the Paris climate conditions, our per capita GDP is going to go down. But only by 2%. Um, I'm still just about done, but not done yet. I'll have to call you back. So here, here's the deal. That um, Here's your money angle. And it's interesting when you look at China, because in the beginning, a lot of this stuff is going to come out of China. And so they, 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 they're kind of the winners. But, and, but then you look at Russia, and, and they're kind of a winner, too if they go green. European Union is already pretty green. And so they're not going to change much if they stay with Paris. Well, after all, it is a Paris agreement, so they won't want anything bad to happen to themselves. But anyway, this is very interesting because uh, <clears throat> well, here, here, here's the numbers. And, and here's where we go if we don't get on board here and get it right. Uh, and it's particularly looking between the United States and China. What could happen to us if we don't wise up and keep going? Um, and so sectors really affected. Well, you know, Nebraska really got hit hard in 2019 from flooding. Uh, infrastructure, flood damage, it caused an awful lot of money and damage. Forget about the hurricane, just the floods, and everybody can get those almost. <clears throat> then you add wind and fire. Has anybody noticed that your uh, homeowner's insurance is going down? Uh, keep your eye on your insurance bill, because uh, that's where uh, the larger fraction, uh, yeah, larger fraction of our income is now going to the grocery store as well, but it's also going to insurance payments. And a smaller fraction is going to the sort of stuff that it would be called discretionary spending. And then there's the greener ethics idea. And uh, why not do the right thing and earn a few dollars in the same time and save the planet all in one and be ethical about it? I mean, these are pretty good incentives. So anyway, <clears throat> maybe gross national product isn't the best way to measure how healthy the planet is. Maybe a better method is the greenhouse gas concentration. And fortunately, as we've mentioned, we just have to remember that when all is said and done, a lot more is said than done, and we have to make sure we change that. Because we've, there's some folks out there who deserve it. And there's also a whole lot of other creatures out there that deserve it. So that ends it, folks. Um, thank you for joining us. Oh, and now uh, I can close. I'm still screen sharing, so let's stop sharing. No, let's do this. It's much nicer to go back here and do the slideshow. <clears throat> because now, if anybody has any further comments or questions, it's 4.05, so we have actually kind of used up our time. Uh, but if uh, we still have 34 participants online, anyone has any Qs or As, uh, type them in quickly, and we'll see what we can do here. Here's one. Gary? Okay, I will appreciate your... Uh, I'm assuming then you felt it was worth using up these two hours and getting those two credits toward renewal of your license. And uh, my pleasure. You probably got an idea that... I mean, I, I was a professor for 35 years, and... Uh, 
I love teaching. And when I get into something, I really, you probably notice that. So uh, and thanks to all of you. And uh, since we're at 406, <clears throat> I think we'll bring this to an end. And uh, hope you all have a good Thanksgiving and a good winter season. And uh, we're all set. I'm going to watch the participant box, and uh, when the number of participants approaches zero, then I will shut down. But meanwhile, if there's anything left, 